You're watching Keystone Science, and in today's episode, we're going to show you how to make your very own plasma globe. Okay, so one quick announcement before we get started. I started up a chat room on the app called Discord for this channel. Now, it's not just an app, you can also get to it from your computer. But you guys should definitely come join it because it should be a great place for you guys to ask questions and maybe meet some new people. And so hopefully from it, you can get some pretty good help. And so here's the code that you can use to join that chat and yeah, you guys should come join it. Today's project will be dealing with high voltage, so make sure that you stay safe for this project. So with that said, let's go straight into building it. Here's the circuit that we're going to be using. As you can see, the main components for this project is this 555 timer and this, the ignition coil. You can buy plenty of these 555 timer chips on a place like eBay. The ignition coil, however, will be a little bit more hard to find than that. You can purchase them on eBay, however, there's an auto scrap yard, that's where I went. And from that, I got four of them. And so you're going to want to find one of these older ones where it just has these two inputs here, then the high voltage out. And so from that, they can come looking like this, or typically like this. And then right here, we have a 50,000 ohm potentiometer. For potentiometers, I just bought this cheap kit also on eBay, and it costs less than $10 and has a bunch of different values. So yeah, that's pretty useful. And then just a one kilo ohm resistor, and then probably an assortment of anywhere from around one to 100 nanofarad capacitors. I say that because this capacitor takes part in changing the output frequency of the 555 timer. And so if you want to be testing different frequencies, you may want to get an assortment of them. And then lastly, you'll want an N-channel MOSFET. Now the MOSFET that I'll be using, and my favorite MOSFET, is the IRFP260N. And so let's begin by putting out the circuit onto this breadboard. First, enter your 555 timer chip into a position like this. This way, each of the different pins on the 555 timer chip will be on different rails, so they'll each have separate connections. Now with our 555 timer, this is pin 2, this is pin 6, this is pin 7, this is pin 4, this is pin 8, this is pin 3, this is pin 1, and this is pin 5. Now actually, a quick correction to the circuit, it should not be connected up to pin 5, and instead it should be connected up to pin 3. So yeah, sorry about that mess up there, guys. Now what this means for the actual chip is that if you're holding the chip where the little divot is like this, and then it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And so yeah, that's the pinout that we should be referring to for the 555 timer chip. And so let's start by connecting pin 1 up to this negative rail over here. For this capacitor here, I'll be using this capacitor. And as you can see using my transistor tester, it has a value of around 46 nanofarads. And so I'm going to insert this capacitor from pin 2 to the ground rail. Okay, now I'm going to take a connection wire from pin 6 to pin 2. And then I have this 50,000 ohm potentiometer, which as you can see has one center pin and two bottom legs here. And for convenience sake, I'm going to insert it down here. And then this wire is going to be connected from pin 6 to the center pin of the potentiometer. And then one of the other open legs of the potentiometer need to be connected up to pin 7. And now I can take this 1,000 ohm resistor, and that can be inserted between pin 7 and pin 8. Now we simply need to connect pin 8 to pin 4, and then pin 4 needs to be connected to the positive rail. So now the last thing we need to do for this part of the circuit is connect it up to the MOSFET. Like I said earlier, I'm going to be using this IRFP260N. This part of the circuit is our gate, this part's our drain, and this part is our source. And so on our MOSFET, from left to right, it goes gate, drain, source. The MOSFET sort of acts like a mechanical switch, except for it's powered by electricity. And so if I apply a voltage from the gate to the source, it opens up the switch, allowing voltage to flow from the drain to the source. And so using this, since the 555 timer will be outputting a low current frequency wave, we can sort of amplify that wave by connecting it up to this. As then, whatever current is flowing this way will adapt to the square wave as it's being turned on and off. Since the MOSFET is likely to heat up, we can attach it to this heat sink. First apply a little bit of thermal grease to the back of the MOSFET, and then simply secure it onto the heat sink using a screw. Now I can insert this MOSFET onto these three pins back here. And then since pin 3 is our output pin, I'm going to connect a wire from it going to the gate of the MOSFET. Now I should mention that your MOSFET may have a different pinout than mine, so be sure that you search up the part number in order to find out the correct pinout. Now I can connect a wire going from the source of the MOSFET to the negative rail. Now that we have this part of the circuit done, let's connect it up to a 9 volt battery and see what the wave looks like on an oscilloscope. And so the negative of the battery connects up to the negative rail, and then the positive of the battery gets connected up to the positive rail. And so now the circuit should be oscillating. I'm going to attach one end of my oscilloscope probe up to pin 3, and the other end of the oscilloscope probe can be attached to the ground rail. Now, first on the oscilloscope, we can see these two lines and it's kind of all fidgeting all over the place. So let's go ahead and try to tune it into the correct channel and see what we're getting. So as you can see, this is the square wave that the 555 timer is outputting. Now watch the square wave as I turn that potentiometer that we put onto the circuit. As you can see, I can change the frequency to be lower or higher. So now that we know that the 555 timer circuit is working properly, let's go ahead and try to work on the ignition coil. 
This is the ignition coil that I'm going to be using. As you can see, it has these two input wires and then one output for the high voltage. This is because the other end of the high voltage coil is just connected back up to the primary coil. And so that means the ends that this high voltage output will be arcing to are these two wires here. We can first begin by connecting one of these two wires from the ignition coil up to the drain of the MOSFET. The other end is going to go to the positive of our power supply, so I'll connect that up now. Now the negative of our power supply, which in your case could be a drill battery, is going to be connected up to the common negative rail on the breadboard. In order to test this, I'm going to be using this variable DC power supply I have. As you can see, this power supply can go from 0 to 32 volts DC. And it can supply up to 10 amps, so this should be perfect for testing the circuit. In order to verify that this is working, I'm going to connect this end of the wire up to the high voltage output. And then once I turn on the supply, I'm going to touch it to this red wire going out and see if we can get an arc from it. And so I'm going to turn on the supply in 3, 2, 1. As you can see, we are getting an output from it. By the way, when you test this, be sure that you're using a non-conductive stick like this. This way you won't shock yourself, as that could be quite painful. Now that was at an input of 15 volts, so now I have it turned up to 32, and let's see the arc we can draw. As a stand to hold the plasma bulb, I have this cheap socket here. For the purpose of testing, I'm going to take the high voltage wire and connect it up to one of these terminals. Now inside of that terminal, I'm going to connect up a regular bulb. Now I'm going to turn it back on and we'll tune this to the correct frequency where we can see plenty of plasma inside the bulb. You guys couldn't see that, but it was actually making a whole lot of corona at that frequency from this wire to the core of the transformer. And so let me try connecting that up again and then moving it a little bit further away from the transformer. So as you can see, there's a point where when we turn it, we hear a whole lot of corona. Now it's a very fine point, but when we find it, that means we're in resonance with the coil. And my point is right there. As you can see on the bulb, there's a little bit of a streamer going off. And you may have noticed that quite a bit of the high voltage is being lost through over here. And so now that I know that it does work, I'm going to transfer all of this onto a PCB board, and then we'll try to build a little bit of an enclosure and try to make sure that this is well isolated. And so here it is, I'll put out onto the breadboard. Now I'll admit, I did actually just use the same breadboard as I had made from a previous episode. And so that's why this has an audio input here, and also a weird LED back here. However, this project won't be using the audio input, so there's no need to worry about that. And in fact, if you do want to see the projects that have used the audio input, I'll leave it linked in the description as we made music play through light and also a plasma speaker. But as you can see, I do have the capacitor on a solderless terminal, so it'll be easier to change out. Okay, so I have the lights turned out so you guys can better see the corona, and I also have the bulb switched out for another one. And so, as you can see, let's crank this up to around 9 volts. And as you can see, we are getting some firing inside the bulb. Now let's put it up to 12 volts. Right around here, you can start to see the bulb better conducting everything inside of it. And this voltage right here at this frequency is completely safe to touch. In fact, I feel nothing at all from it. Also, you may have been noticing this compact fluorescent light bulb was lighting up from the background there. But just so it helps to see the corona, I'm going to move this out of the shot. Also, you can start to see over on the physical transformer that it is starting to leak a little bit of high voltage through it. But going back to the plasma bulb, let's now turn it up to... Right now, it is at 17 volts. And so I can feel slight tingling from this. And it's probably not good to leave it in one spot for too long, as it may melt the glass. And then I won't touch it from here on up, but let's go ahead and see what it looks like at now 22 volts. Now that we know that everything works for sure, let's go ahead and build a nice enclosure for it. And here's what that looked like with the lights turned on. So you can still see quite a bit from it, it's just not as spectacular as when the lights are turned off. Now here's that same square wave that we were looking at earlier. If you're curious, the frequency is around 113,636 hertz. Here I have this other probe on channel 2, and I'm just going to set it off to the side here, not connect it up to anything. But if I turn on channel 2, you can see that we get another wave forming. The closer I move it, you can see the amplitude of the wave does go up. And so that's actually the exact same frequency, except for it's perfectly sinusoidal, being emitted from the high frequency high voltage. In fact, before how we only get the high voltage when we hit it at that perfect frequency point, that's because that's its resonation point. And if I were to change the frequency just even slightly, that frequency wave would be much less strong because it would be interfering with its own self. Before I build a casing for it, I need to find a power supply, as I don't plan on using my DC power supply for it when I'm trying to make the final product. And so for my power supply, I decided on this old laptop charger. This outputs 19 volts DC at 3.95 amps. So this should definitely be more than enough to get the plasma globe effect to work properly. To connect it up, you could just cut the wires exposing them down here, so then you can connect it up to the circuit. However, since I have this little terminal here, I'm just going to be using that since it slides perfectly in, and then I can attach the wires onto down here. Be sure you check which one's the positive and which one is the negative so you don't connect it up backwards. I'm just going to do it here with my multimeter. And so now, if it connects up to the laptop power supply, let's activate the frequency generator and see if it works. As you can see, it still does work quite well. 
For the case, I'm simply going to be using this cardboard box. It has plenty of space on the inside to fit all the components. And so just for looks, I'm going to coat all of this in a black color of paint so it doesn't look like a cardboard box pretty much. And then I'll be right back with you guys. So now with the parts of the box that are showing spray painted black, we need to fit everything inside. I decided I'm still going to be powering this oscillation circuit with a 9 volt battery since my 9 volt battery is rechargeable and I don't really need it for anything else at the moment. However, if you just want to power it off of the power supply, you could probably use something like a resistor divider circuit to get the voltage down to 9 volts so that it could easily feed into this. On the common negative to both of them, I'm going to be installing this switch. This way it'll shut off both the oscillation circuit and the plasma bulb circuit. And so I'm just going to poke a hole in the side of this, then carefully cut it out to be the size of the button. Now that it's around this size, I should be able to put these wires through and force the button into place. And just like that, we have our button neatly installed on the outside with a flush finish. Right next to the button, I'm going to be putting our common adapter to go to the power supply. Okay, so now everything is done and I secured the transformer to the side here with some hot glue along with the circuit. So now all we need to do is poke a hole in the middle of this to run this wire up to go to the light bulb. It may be good also to coat this top layer here in epoxy. This way you'll get less of the power going to the corona here, but it shouldn't really matter all that much. So I'm just going to poke that hole approximately in the center right there. And then now I can take this yellow wire and feed it on through. Now to attach it to the screw on base terminal, I'm just going to wrap the wire around the screw and then simply screw in the screw till it gets to a secure connection. And with that final step, our plasma ball is now complete. And so now we can go ahead and plug in the power supply and give it a test run. And now as you can see, when we flip the switch, the whole thing becomes active. So let's go ahead and turn off the lights and get some better shots. As you can see, the bulb makes an extremely cool orange glow when you touch it. Now the color will depend on the kind of bulb you use as the different gases inside of it affect the color. For instance, here I have another kind of bulb inserted and as you can see when I turn it on it gives a much more purple glow when I touch it. And in fact with this I can get this cool double globe effect. You can see when I get near it with this power the electrons are really jumping off my finger into it. I would also recommend coating the transformer inside of some sort of uh, resistive material such as either wax or hot glue or oil. And those should make it so it performs a lot better out the top here, because a lot of it's being lost to the corona inside. And of course, it does still light up things like neon bulbs, as well as things like fluorescent tubes. So now you know how to make your very own plasma bulb. Thank you all so much for watching the video. If you enjoyed this video and or learned something new, I'd really appreciate it if you leave a thumbs up or share it with a friend as it really helps the channel quite a bit. And if you have any suggestions for videos that you would like to see me do in the coming weeks, go ahead and leave it in the comment section below and I'll get back to you. Remember guys, this project is high voltage, so make sure that you have everything secured up because even inside the box that I made, without the wires being secured up, they were arcing to each other and could potentially cause a fire, so you want everything to be well insulated. And so with that in mind, please remember to be safe and have a wonderful day. You're watching Keystone Science, and in today's episode we're going to show you how to make a very simple high voltage power supply out of a fluorescent bulb.